Hi everyone, I'm Ali. Uh, I'm going to present Sandtrap today, something that my co-authors and I spent the past few years working very hard to get everything working. And I'm going to begin today's talk uh, with a quick discussion on uh, Taint Droid, the Taint tracking tool for Android that many of us in this community are aware of. At a high level, the way Taint Droid works is it assigns unique tags to different kinds of data on our device. During runtime, as the app makes use of our data, Taint Droid propagates the tags appropriately and lets us know when tainted data leaves the phone, say through the network. Taint Droid was initially developed to help us answer this question. What are apps doing with our data? After all, they do have access to a lot of our personal content, and we really want to know if they are accessing and sharing them in un unexpected ways. But something interesting has happened since Taint Droid's publication. We have seen a lot of research papers use Taint Droid creatively as building blocks for some other higher level service. Mobile Hub, for example, uses Taint Droid to track an app's access patterns uh, to sensor data on the device. And it makes use of that information to minimize the app's impact on the device's battery life, which is kind of cool if you think about it. So what I'm really trying to say here is, Taint Tracking is a useful primitive for mobile services, some of which have absolutely nothing to do with privacy and security. However, Taintroid has a limitation which is becoming more and more severe. And to discuss this, I need to dive into some Android app details. An Android app is typically written in the Java programming language. And that portion of the app is executed by a managed runtime that's available in Android. Now, an app can also call native code via the Java native interface. By native code, I mean code written in C or C++. Taintroid works exceptionally well at taint tracking the Java bytecode portion of the app, or the managed code portion. However, it does not do any native code taint tracking whatsoever. And in fact, it prevents apps from using their own native code. And this is the problem, because a lot of apps do use native code. The Instagram app, for example, uses native code to implement image filters, which users can use to alter the appearance of their images. And it's not just Instagram. In an informal study, we downloaded about 80,000 apps from the Google Play Store and found that about 40% of them use some native code. So if you want to continue using taint tracking with these new kinds of apps, with these modern apps, we need to seriously start thinking about uh, tracking native code. And it is precisely this we developed with Sandtrap. In our system, we continue relying on Taintroid to track the Java bytecode portion of the app and we built the additional piece to track native code whenever the app makes use of the JNI. Sandtrap is cool because it runs on a real smartphone hardware with unmodified Android apps downloaded from the Google Play Store. There were a lot of challenges in trying to get this to work. I'm going to describe two of them today, and I'm also going to discuss parallel permissions, the technique we, de we developed to make all of this practical. With that said, on to the first challenge. Take a look at this, three, uh, this sequence of assembly uh, code. It's really simple. All it does is it adds two values together and stores it somewhere in memory. To taint track this piece of code, we need to add a whole bunch of instrumentation, which in practice slows down the app, I mean the original code, by 8 to 10x. And this is not just a function of our prototype. If you survey taint tracking literature, you'll see that the overheads are all over the place, from 10x to 50x. On the one hand, this is not surprising because we are, we are doing a lot of additional work that the original app did not do. But where it's really problematic is if this overhead is constant throughout the app's lifetime, because what that means is uh, taint tracking ceases to be attractive. It's just way too slow. We clearly need to do better. And one way to do that is to observe that we don't have to do native code taint tracking all the time. We only need to do it when the app handles tainted data. Now, we did not come up with this idea. It was developed in an earlier work. And let's see how it functions in a system where there's only a single thread running at a time. So on the left, you have a single thread. On the right, you have memory that's organized in four kilobyte virtual pages. And there is a page with tainted data. What this system does is it applies page protections on that page with tainted data to prevent reads and writes. To begin, the thread runs at full speed. The moment it tries to access tainted data, it will trap. And on a trap, an emulator will begin to both run the thread and to perform the appropriate taint tracking. But before the emulator begins, the system removes the protections from the tainted page. 
so that the emulator itself may access the tainted data, which it needs to do so since it's also running the thread. Before I continue further, recall that in a multi-threaded process, all threads uh, are bound equally to the protections applied in that process's address space. With that in mind, let's revisit, let's revisit the previous slide in the context of Android, where apps are inherently multi-threaded and devices are typically multi-core, so there is true parallelism. To begin, all threads run at full speeds. And when a thread tries to access tainted data, it's going to trap and be emulated, and the system's going to remove the page protections just as before. But observe here that now, if a different thread tries to access the same tainted data, it's not going to trap because the same page protections apply equally to all threads. So we are not going to taint track thread D, which is a problem. And this problem appears in a slightly different context. So in this slide, in the, top, the top two threads are running managed code or some Java bytecode. The bottom two threads are running some native code via the JNI, and on the right, there is some buffer with tainted data that's shared with both managed and native code. By the way, this is an access pattern we, see, we have observed in real Android apps. Recall that we are still relying on taint droid to taint track the Java bytecode or the managed portion of the app. So if these threads access tainted data, that's OK. Taint droid is performing the taint tracking constantly. We do not want any protections on this page because if we did have protections, the managed thread will trap and be emulated, which is something we do not want. However, the native threads are tracked on demand and not constantly because of the overhead issue I just talked about. And if at this moment they were to access tainted data, it's not going to trap, which is the same problem we saw before. So we are in a bit of a bind, and one way out is to claim that the real problem here is parallelism. Perhaps we should not run threads in parallel if they require different permissions to the same shared address space. Perhaps the real solution here is pause the untracked native threads whenever the managed UI threads run and vice versa. Will this work? Well, we ran an experiment with eBooker and eBook reading and an eBook viewer app where we loaded a complicated PDF file, which the app does using native code in background threads. During the loading process, we recorded the update rate of the UI, which is displayed in the y-axis as the frames per second. There are two lines in this graph, with one with parallel scheduling, meaning threads can execute in parallel, and permissions-driven scheduling, where threads do not run in parallel if they require different permissions to the same address space. There are two things to observe here. First, with parallel scheduling, it takes less time to load the PDF file which is to be expected, because in permissions-driven scheduling, whenever the UI thread runs, the background thread that's supposed to load the PDF file is paused, and it needs to wait for some future time slice to run. But what happens when the background thread runs? Well, the UI thread is paused, and in Android, that means the app interactivity is impaired, and that might trigger the dreaded app not responding exception, which is really bad. So then the answer is not in hindering parallelism. Somehow we must enable threads to run in parallel, even though they require different permissions to the same shared address space. And it is to enable this that we developed parallel permissions. So let's take a look at how Santra makes use of this. Given a page with tainted data, we place different protections on the same page, and we select threads to use one of these two permissions types uh, depending on their requirement. And just to be crystal clear about this, parallel permissions does not place threads in isolated address spaces. They will ultimately access the same physical data in memory. The only thing that's different here compared to conventional memory permissions is that they have different permissions to the address space. We implemented parallel permissions first with an architectural feature in the ARMv7 architecture known as memory domains. Uh, there are several parts to this, so I'm going to go through this step by step. ARMv7 uses a two-level page table to translate virtual addresses to physical addresses. Whenever you set page protections on a page, those are recorded in the second-level table. But the first-level table contains something interesting known as a domain number. Now, this is just a logical domain. Uh, there are 16 possible domains. Many are unused. 
and all memory by default is in domain zero. So we took one of these unused domains, uh, reserved it for our purposes, and call it the tracked domain. Whenever a page receives tainted data, we set page protections just like in the previous slide. But then we also go to the corresponding first level table entry and update the domain number to the tracked domain. So this is the first part of memory domains. The next thing is each CPU core in ARM v7 has something known as the domain access control register, which allows you to control the currently executing threads permissions to each of the 16 logical domains. There are three permissions types, no access, client, and manager. In this work, we are only going to focus on the last two. So client permissions, uh, client permissions is the default, uh, and it's what we all expect. Whenever you access memory under a domain with only client permissions, the memory access is allowed or denied based on the appropriate page protections. Manager mode is where it gets interesting. If you were to access memory under a domain while having manager permissions to that domain, page protections are completely ignored and the memory access is unconditionally allowed. As you may imagine, this is really dangerous, but if used appropriately, it enables parallel permissions, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you right now. So in this slide, you have a managed UI thread on the top, uh, three native threads, and on the right, you have uh, a page with tainted data, and the surrounding region of memory is in the tracked domain. To begin, all threads run at full speeds. The moment a thread tries to access tainted data, it's going to trap. But this time, instead of removing the page protections from the tainted page, we are going to give the thread manager permissions over the tracked domain. So from, from this point onwards, future accesses by that thread to the tracked domain is going to be allowed. It's not going to be bound by the page protections. If a different native thread were to access tainted data now, it's still going to trap. Thread C's manager permissions did not permit thread D to access the tainted data. And one more thing to observe here is that threads running managed code that are being uh, taint tracked by Taintroid also have manager mode over the tracked domain. So uh, it can access tainted data without trapping. So we have successfully achieved what we set out to do enable threads to run in parallel while having different permissions to the same shared address space. Now, there are a lot of details I unfortunately do not have time to go over. Maybe it's fortunate for you. Uh, so we had a lot of bugs uh, while implementing memory domains. Uh, while this made our lab closer because we were always, you know, I was always crying and saying something was wrong, I think I also aged a lot, and so I don't know if the trade-off is worth it. We also implemented memory domains with multiple page tables because we observed that memory domains is an architectural feature that's not always widely available, but we wanted to show that parallel permissions uh, is a general technique, so you can use page tables as well. And in addition to parallel permissions, we uh, spent a lot of effort trying to make the emulator and the taint tracker. All these details are in the paper, you can read them, and you can also ask me questions offline. With that, I'm going to go into our performance evaluation. So we implemented Sandtrap on a old phone, a Galaxy Nexus device. It has a dual core CPU, a gigabyte of RAM, and it runs an old version of Android uh, because we rely on Android. To measure the performance impact of Sandtrap, we compared it to stock Android, and we also measured, and, and the way we got our overheads was uh, by measuring the time the app spent in native functions. In this graph, we show 10 apps uh, running all sorts of workloads with native code while we were tracking camera, GPS, and microphone data. Of these 10 apps, Instagram is the only app that accesses data, uh, tainted data, namely images from the camera, and therefore it has the largest slowdown. Of the remaining apps, most apps experience little to no slowdown, which is what we want, that's good. But there are some apps that experience significant slowdowns despite not accessing tainted data uh, in native code. And this is because they do a lot of boundary crossings from managed code to native code. And each time that happens, we need to trap into the kernel to uh, change the permissions it has over the address space. But all in all, what we observe is the overhead is proportional to the amount of tainted data uh, the app accesses in native code. 
We also did a uh, end to end energy consumption experiment and we see the same thing. Uh, when the workload accesses, uh, does not access the tainted data that we are tracking, there's little to close no, uh, little to no overhead. So there's a lot of related work. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go over them. So I'm just going to conclude uh, right now. So the star of today's show is undoubtedly parallel permissions, which allows us to share an address space between threads with different permissions. And although I have presented this in the context of uh, Sandtrap and native code taint tracking, we are excited about this because we think there are a lot of uh, uh, use cases. Uh, our code is available, also available for Sandtrap. Uh, and uh, in a week or two, I'll also uh, make available our Raspberry Pi implementation of parallel permissions. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening, and I'll, I'll be happy to take questions right now.